right, welcome to UC Santa Barbara's Innovator Story Series. I'm John Greathouse. You can follow me on Twitter, at John Greathouse. Our sponsor tonight is Pay Junction. Founded in 2000, Pay Junction has disrupted the payment, payment processing industry by offering transparency and award-winning service. An all-in-one payment platform, Pay Junction was recently voted one of Glassdoor's best places to work. So not only do they have a great solution that's being used all over the world, they're also a nice place to go to every day. It's great culture, and especially for young people. So if anybody's out there thinking about wanting to live in Santa Barbara, beautiful Santa Barbara, you might want to think about Pay Junction. If you want to think about how you can get your customers to pay you faster and more efficiently, you should be thinking about Pay Junction. We really appreciate their support. They've been a longtime sponsor, and they help make this possible, allows us to film this and have it go out all over the world. So tonight, I'm going to be speaking with Eve Nelson. Eve is an Emmy Award-winning musical entrepreneur. She's been a songwriter, composer, producer, arranger, and a conductor. Eve is an innovator who's captured, who can capture the essence and emotion of pop, R&B, hip-hop, dance, classical, and even heart-wrenching ballads. She's a 2018 Daytime Emmy Award winner for Best Original Song and 2015 Daytime Emmy nominee. She signed her first publishing deal with Zamba Publishing and broke out as a record producer with Jive Records, where she produced Donna Summer, uh, Angela um, Bofel, Darlene Love, and Tremaine Hawkins. Eve co-wrote I Know You By Heart, which was covered by the late Eva Cassidy. Most recently, very recently, one of her songs from The Office was sampled by Billie Eilish, uh, My Strange Addiction. So next time you listen to My Strange Addiction, you're listening to Eve Nelson. In addition to The Office, Eve has composed and song produced for a number of primetime series. I'm only going to name a few of them. Um, this Is Us, American Housewife, Code Black, The Kids, all right, the Kids Are All Right, The Ranch, Blackish, Betrayal, Grey's Anatomy, Scrubs, Modern Family, and I guarantee you that is a subset of her credits. Right? It goes on and on and on. Classically trained, Eve was awarded the very first ASCAP scholarship from the Berklee College of Music, the best musical school in America, where she graduated with honors in two years. Eve continues to give back. We always like to bring people to our stage that um, have been successful professionally, but also are willing to give back of their time and their, and their uh, hard earned money. Uh, she's given a back to the music community in a variety of ways, including by mentoring young alumni, as well as hosting workshops entitled Women in Tune. Let's welcome Eve to our class. <laughs> wow. Okay, that's it. Wow. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for coming. So I know you, you've got an incredibly busy, we're going to talk about a little bit later about how you manage timelines and right. you work in a business where it's all about, you know, you got to be there. Uh, you yeah. gotta, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But we do appreciate you taking the time to come up here oh, from thank you Los Angeles, me. California. Yeah. So let's go back in time. Mm -hmm. You grew up in Florida. You, yep. you, as I mentioned in your introduction, you were playing classical piano. Yes. Uh, I have actually had a couple other people, um, Jonathan Brown, he produced the Black Eyed Peas and Eminem and mm -hmm. others. He also went to Berkeley. Um, and he, he took a similar path to you in the sense that he knew he didn't want to be a performer. He felt right. like most of the kids wanted to be performers yeah. and be stars or whatever, yeah. and he didn't take that path. Yeah. When did you know that you wanted to be a composer, uh, songwriter, as opposed to a performer? I knew pretty early on. I went to a, a high school in Miami Beach, kind of a Santa Barbara type of vibe. and. Uh, we had, a, we had a, a, a band called the Miami Beach High Rock Ensemble. And so I, <laughs> I got into this band, and of course, you know, that was like the end of my classical music career. <laughs> um, and what did your parents think of that? Were they pretty well, bummed out? Or? My mom was a piano. Yeah, I mean, my, a little bummed out, a little bummed out. Yeah. But, but I, I think that as they, as they heard the songs that I started writing, the mm. bummed out got... Right. You so know. like, hey, she's got talent. Exactly. <laughs> Um, uh, so anyway, I was in this band, and wait, what was the question? I'm completely. I have, AD, <laughs> I have, no I have idea. ADD. Does any do any of you have ADD? Come on, raise your hand. Don't lie. Ugh. So I was I'm, I was trying to get at. I thought it was interesting. You went to Berkeley, yeah. kind of knowing you wanted to be a composer. Okay, so I got so I basically got into this band, and when I had to get out front, it it just was very uncomfortable. Like even mm. now, I'm I usually have a piano in front of me. 
So it's it's just it was just not a natural. Right. It wasn't a natural sort of. Right. I I didn't like the attention. I've heard that from musicians too. They say without a guitar, they just feel really. Oh yeah, I like. I, I feel like I might as well just be naked right now. <laughs> this is this is weird. If we were in Santa Barbara, you could do that if you. <laughs> Um, oh, definitely. It might not, not make it on uh, <laughs> broadcast television, but hmm. so so you pretty knew pretty early on. Yeah. So you go to you go to Berkeley, you do quite well there. Mm -hmm. You graduate um, in two years. So you leave, but you don't go right to New York, which I found interesting. You didn't sort of jump right into the New York slog, and I think this can be instructive for students because that first job out of college can make oh, you, yeah, that was, yeah. you can obsess about mm -hmm. it, right? So you go to Century Three Teleprodu Teleproductions in Boston, and I found it interesting, you were adapting library music for TV and radio ads. That's right. So I'd love to hear uh, how, how, how did, what, was, what were the fun, fundamental elements or the foundational elements that, that at the time you might not have felt like you were really picking up, but in retrospect, you look back on that job and realize, hey, that wasn't a bad first job. Oh my God, it, it, it was the dreamy, well, this is a great story. So. I was sitting, we called it Berkeley Beach. It's the, it's the sidewalk at Berkeley. And um, we were all sitting out there and I heard that there was an audition for this job. And I was gonna go back to Miami. I didn't, I, I didn't know what I was gonna do. It's, right. that, it's that like- Most students. It's that four months before you're leaving college and you're like, oh my God, am I going home? Like, help me God, right? Yeah. Um, and I, uh, I heard about this audition. I went and auditioned, and, and in those days, they had something called a Kurzweil. It's like this big, huge thing that they don't have anymore. And um, they asked me to just, they said, they gave me a scene, and they said, just play something. Mm. Anyway, um, oh, oh, wait, wait. What I wanted to say first is I sent a demo reel, and they didn't call me back, and I was so insecure about that. What I did was I, I kind of ignored it. And so one mm. of the women who worked there said, please, please call again. Go get that live audition. So that's what got me the job is the so live audition. So where did audition. she work? She worked at the She was an intern uh -huh. at Century 3. It's, uh -huh. like, a, it's like a post-production house. Okay. And she, um, she basically said, you know, don't give up. And mm -hmm. I was Good. feeling very insecure. Sometimes and, we need that. Yeah, yeah. And so I went and I did the audition and, you know, I actually got the job, which was unbelievable because because I was, Come they, on. yeah, and they picked me over the dude. Sorry, dudes. <laughs> <laughs> there was a dude ahead of me. Um, but why do you say it was unbelievable? I mean, obviously you've had a stellar career. So, well, you know, because I was just, I was 20, 20, mm -hmm. I was 20 and you know, this was like this plush, beautiful place with big, huge screens everywhere. I mean, it was very Hollywood, even mm -hmm. though it was in mm -hmm. Boston. Mm -hmm. And so, it, you know, I felt very honored, even though it was $14,000 a year, which, <laughs> right. how do you live on that, right? Right, right. Um, so I got the job, and, and the job was to pull library music for radio commercials. But what they, what they did say is they said, if we need you to come in and play something on a commercial, um, can, will you be able to do that? And, uh, that's, and yes, the Absolutely. answer is I did, yes. <laughs> So that's how that whole start. Yep. Th that's how that started, and, and three months into that, I was asked to write um, the Boston Bruins theme. Which is a so, so I understand that was your <laughs> your first songwriting credit. I was just so freaked out. Yeah, they said, "Can you write a sports theme?" I said, "Yeah, sure. Why not?" So how did it go? Do you remember? <laughs> I I basically got in touch with one of my instructors, Mike Zachmeister, who was like a techie kind of producer guy. And I said, I'm freaking out. And we didn't even have, I mean, digital, are, are any, is there a lot of musicians here today? Or? How many folks want to do something in the creative arts? Well, so you know Pro Tools, right? <laughs> All that stuff. Um, there was none of that. There was literally, it was just sort right. of happening. And right. so uh, he brought over his DMX drum machine. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I programmed the drum part and hired all my horn teachers from Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> nice. and, uh, I'm not sure they were pretty good. Yeah, and that was the beginning of my entire, that was the beginning of, of my career. So do you remember how it went? Like, how did it? It's, you can Google it. It, it, it would be, I'm so scared to tell you the year. It was a while, it wasn't that long. It was 100 years. Um, yeah, it was, yes, it was like, bam, 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 you know, with the horns, ba -da 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 -ba -ba, you know, very like 80s. Yep. Kind of like when I listen to it now, I, cr I cringe. But it, it's pretty, it's, it's still pretty hot. 
I yeah, mean, I mean, yeah. and it worked, right? They used it, and they must. They have used pretty... it for about ten years. Wow, nice. Yeah. And I didn't, I didn't have ASCAP on it because, right, it was a buyout. Yeah, and that happens, right, yeah. when you're young, and yeah. sometimes you do things. So I, I tell students, there's a time to learn and a time to earn. Exactly. You were in the learning phase. Totally. Right? So you, and that was a good experience. Getting paid for you. to learn. Yeah. So I never, I, I didn't ask Eve if she would remember that, but I knew you would. Like I just knew that you would under, you would remember those. That was probably way. the most exciting moment in my life. Yeah, and that then is you, cool. And then you, you're like with your friends and you're watching TV and, and it comes on. It was yeah. the open. It yeah. was the open for all the Boston Bruins games. And then I did the Red Sox. Yep. So, Two iconic and then teams I, in a and sports then I did, And then I did a Larry uh, Bird video called Winning Basketball, which was like this iconic video. Right, right, right. So yeah, I was like sports music girl. Good. And so yeah. you, you, you took a job where I think some students could have turned their nose up to it, like I'm a performer or I'm not too good for this or whatever. Yeah. And I think sometimes students, they have that gold mine, which they should have. Um, but they want to draw that really straight line right to it. And sometimes yeah. you have to take the detours along the way that maybe they don't pay off. Maybe you don't realize they're paying off until later. Well, yeah. And, you know, the thing is, is I want, you know, a lot of people want to be, fam be famous. Right. That's, I find with a lot of young people, it's like right. all about being famous. And there's some, Until they are famous, right? Right. And there, <laughs> there's something um, wonderful about wanting to just be good mm, and just mm. be great at your craft. Right. And I really wanted to be good. I was, I was kind of obsessed with being good. So, did you um, feel like you had something to prove? Where did you think that came yeah. from? Uh, well, I can't. I, ugh, God, that's, that's like a, a two-hour therapy session. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Um, have you overcome that? Let me ask you that. Do you feel like you still have something to prove? I, I feel like I always have things to prove to myself. Mm -hmm. It's well, not about it's not good. so much about proving them to other people. Right. It used to be my parents. Sure, and, sure. You know. We've all gone through that. Right. Um, but it, it's it's proving proving things. Yes, I but do. But I think that's a healthy proof. Like I think oh, yeah, if you're, it is. If you're, if you're trying to prove yourself, especially as you advance in your career and you've accomplished a lot of things, it's yeah. good to have new things. That oh, you it's want. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Very good. So you go to New York. Uh, you stayed there about three or four years. And then you headed to New York, and I love this. You set up a home studio, mm -hmm. very entrepreneurial, and I'm sure it was took a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. You started hustling. You made your own luck, right? Uh -huh. And then you met. I don't. I'm not saying this was the event in your life, but at that point you met Keith Diamond, and I'm yes. sure you made. How did that all come about? Like, Keith Diamond. That well, that was um, a friend of mine named Lauren Cannon, who was in the New York Voice. She's in the New York Voices, which is a very well-known jazz group. She. She said, I met this guy, Keith Diamond, who I, at the time, he, Billy Osh, this is like 80s, yeah. 80s. Yeah, 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 but, but, but still, that, he was a huge figure at the time, yep. and, and he wants to, you know, he wants to meet you. So, mm -hmm. and, and so they, they, they brought me down to the studio, and I played, he said, Eve, can you play this thing for me, this piano thing? And anyway, that was, that was it. Then he said, I'm working on a Donna Summer record, mm -hmm. and can you, fly to, uh, can, can you fly to L.A. and work with me on it? You said, let me check, yes. Well, yeah, but, <laughs> but you know, again, I, I, I want to be really honest with everyone tonight. It, yes, I did say yes, but the truth is, is I had, as much as I wanted success, I was also terribly afraid of it. Like mm. getting on that plane and coming mm. to L.A., it, it was terrifying. I must have had 20 panic attacks was on it, the way. Was it fear of failure? Yeah, I think it was fear, fear of everything. Being an imposter. The... Yeah, I, you know, I think it's when you're young. And I, again, I don't know. I'm, I'm assuming that there's many people in this audience who are going to relate to it. It's, it's like you want to be successful. Yep. You want to prove, prove, prove. But at the same time, it's terrifying. Yeah. It really is. But yeah. I think it takes a bit of self-awareness to be a little afraid. Yeah. I think that there's, we've all met the person You're not afraid, who's right. not very afraid, but exactly. they're, they're not very self-aware exactly. either, which <laughs> isn't my favorite kind of person. Exactly. So you had some initial success, obviously it came from your hustling um, three or four years again into New York. You co-founded a production company. Um, yeah, I discovered an artist, Nelson, we, uh, we, Nelson O'Reilly, my business partner, Bernadette oh. O'Reilly. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. I was just, I was just, and that was about the time, if I have the timeline right, I might have it wrong, that you wrote um, I Know You by Heart. Is that correct? Uh, well, yeah, there's a, there's a long span of years there. But maybe um, that's when it got public? Or what was? Well, I Know You by Heart, that's another great story. So t whenever you want to. Let's talk about it. Want, okay. So I Know You by Heart, there was... I mean, I, I, was, uh, I was in my studio in New York. I had a studio basement, um, which I just loved and hid down there. I mean, I, I, I was like whiter than, whiter than those lights. Um, I, my friend Diane Scanlon came over and she said, I have this lyric mm. or title. I have mm. a title. Mm. 
that's called I Know You by Heart. And we had just recently lost a lot of, um, a lot of people. I mean, at, at that time, AIDS was a little bit more discussed yeah, because people right. were actually really dying yep. a lot. Um, and so we had lost a few friends. And we wrote that song in about, fi no, I'm not joking you, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. But after I wrote it, I was like, oh, this is so beautiful and so schmaltzy. It will never, ever get cut. Nobody will ever listen to this. I was sure. And then about a year later, I got a call from uh, my publisher, mm. said, Remember I don't that schmaltzy song? Yeah. <laughs> like this woman, Eva Cassidy, recorded it. She, she, she's in Washington. Uh, she, she's like an independent artist. This oh, is when okay. indie, indie artists I mean, they probably weren't even born, but um, this is when indie artists were just starting yeah, to emerge, right, right. you know, and, and like, like the computer, where like this was very, very early on in that, in that day. So, so anyway, this, um, he said, this, this song, this, this artist is blowing up in England. Yeah. And um, anyway, this is what happened. The song got cut. She, she uh, contracted ovarian cancer and died three months mm. later. And I was the last song she recorded, and the irony is that it was called I Know You By Heart. Right, right. So then her father called us, and he actually titled one of her records, I Know You By Heart. Nice. And uh, that song recouped, I mean, that, that Eva Cassidy recouped my entire publishing deal. Wow. It was a very successful. Wow, good But you. yet underground at the same time. Right. You know. Do you, do you find that you're not a, a good judge of your own <laughs> quality of your own music? Because in that case, you... You didn't think you thought it was a trifle of a song, and it turned out it was a great song. Yeah. Is that is that? It's torture. Yeah, it's torture. Do you feel like you <laughs> err on the side? Are you right more than you're wrong? Or? Well, look, I I feel that the problem with being in the field of pop music in general, mm -hmm. I was never a pop music person. Mm -hmm. So when I came to New York and people, I was being recognized in my early twenties. Um, by you know Jive Records and yeah, uh, you know right. it was like Eve you you have to write this way you have to write this way mm. now even though I could write that way it was not in my heart yep you know um, so I really struggled with that so when you say good you know I I, I struggled with the meaning of good. Because you might write the greatest song in the world and it will never get heard. Right. But it could be your best song you ever wrote. So right, right. I, I, I really struggled with, is it good because it's on the radio? Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. Is it good mm -hmm. because it's in the top ten? And it took me many years to get where I am now, which is, you know, there's, there's stuff you do because you have to put food on the table. Yep. And, there's, and then there's real art. And do you <laughs> feel like with your art where you're not producing to a deadline, you're... you're, you're, you're when you say something's good, other people validate that it's good. Are you, are you pretty consistent with that, or you don't even care about the validation? Well, I think I think it's really, uh, I think it's a matter of opinion. I mean, now as far as good, I mean, good like a recording technique. If something's right. distorted, it sounds good. It, it's usually good or bad. Yeah. But as far as how a song is, mm -hmm. it's a matter of taste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm very non-judgmental about that. I will say something like that's recorded really well. It's not my. It's not my bag. Yeah. You know what I mean? I tried to. Uh, when my children were growing up, um, they would maybe make a, a negative comment about a certain genre, and I would say, "Listen, it's like food. Like, right. I don't like every kind of food, but right. I'm not down on somebody for liking foods that I don't like. Right. So it's. I think that's a good, a good way to look at it. It right is. Now. I mean, at a certain level, when you're just a starting out songwriter or producer, there is that sort of. You know, I would like, in other words, if, if one of you came to me, I'm sorry, what, okay. I'm like, okay. having like war with my, um, if one of you came to me and said, can you listen to my song? I would say, absolutely. And, and, and if you asked me if it was good or bad, I, I probably would say, well, I mean, it would either be, in my opinion, you know, there'd be potential or it'd be ready to put out into mm. the public. Mm -hmm. Or I would say, which I've said more. recently to many young people, you know what? Don't worry, write for a year, write mm, for another mm, year, mm. write, write, write until yep. you're blue in the face. Yep, yep. And, and then start presenting, you know. Uh, that was a question I had for later, but I'll jump to it. Okay. So, um, you know, Kirby Ferguson has made, um, I've referenced this in past interviews, if it sounds familiar to people, but Kirby has, Ferguson made some great videos called Everything's a Remix. Mm -hmm. One was yeah. music, one was movies, it's just one was intellectual property, very well done. Yeah. Um, and he says you have to go through um, you know, this three evolutions, right? Three steps, copying, transforming, and combining. That's right. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on 
when you were in that copying phase, who were you copying? And when did you know that you had reached that transformative stage where well, you had stopped copying people? Well, I still, I write TV music, so I still copy. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Oh God, do we ever stop copying? Um, it, it, if you're talking about copying in a certain style. I'm or, talking more like when you look at, just to clarify, so yeah. like Bob Dylan couldn't stop doing Woody Guthrie at the beginning. Right. Like every time he tried to be Bob Dylan, he was Woody Guthrie. Yeah. And then finally he found his own voice and became Bob Dylan. I think that, yeah, it just happens. <coughs> it's a very weird thing. It's like all of a sudden it just happens. Like you sit down one day and you're like, okay, I've been, you know, I, it's funny. One, one, of my, one of my idols was Shaka Khan, who I now work with. Yeah, yeah. Cool. But um, you just sit down one day and go, wow. That's just me. It's it's all of my influences, mm -hmm. right? But that's me, right? When did you feel like you came to that point? Oh man, I feel like I'm still coming to that point. But but I, I think it happened in different levels. I think, I think I really noticed that happening. Um, God, I'm I'm, I'm going to say or I'm going to say early two thousands. And with you, and I'm going to ask you a question later about all the different elements that you've yeah. worked on. That's a difficult question for you to answer because. You've done so many different things. You, you, you know, you're not just a songwriter. You're not just a performer. No, I'm jack of all trades. You, yeah. You've done a lot. So to ask yeah. you that question, you might say, "Well, as a producer, I felt like I was there then, but as mm -hmm. a writer, so it could, it could be different." Oh yeah. But we all, I think, for young people, that's just a really important point. If you start something new, you could almost guarantee you're not going to be very good at it. Period. I don't right. care how talented you are. Right. If a Mozart didn't wake up, you know, singing or you know, operas, I mean, he had to work very hard to get to that point. Now, talent helps, right? It absolutely helps. But a lot of young people don't want to push through that sucky, sucky part. Oh, you got to suck. Copying. You got to suck. Gotta you got to suck. suck. Oh, yeah. Suck, 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 suck. And Just then you suck. wake up one day and you're going to write a great song and you're going to go, wow, okay. Or writing code or write or doing a I drawing. I have written so many horrible songs. <laughs> horrible. Like I would never even play them in this room. Yeah. You got to do it. You got to. You can't be afraid. And again, this is where you can't be afraid to fail. Yeah. Failing is and succeeding. It's not failing, and it's failing, right? Because no, you're getting it, better. It took me, unfortunately, I'd, I'd love to go back and be their age knowing yeah, what I know right, now. Right. Yeah, wouldn't we all? Yeah. yeah. Anybody want to trade? <laughs> They're like, no. You got to look like this, though. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so we're going to go to the student's question in one second. I'm like, I've got to ask you the question that yeah. you get asked every time you ever speak, I'm sure, uh -huh. uh, and probably most of the times that you're mentoring people, but let's just get out of the way. What advice would you have for a young person, not just in music, but any of the creative arts that wants to make it their livelihood? Right. Hmm. Well, I mean, you, you have to live it, eat it, and breathe it. Mm. I mean, that's, you know, I, I know that's- So you have to put yourself out there. You got a chance. You have, to, you, have to, you have to be a little obsessed with it. I know that sounds unhealthy, yep. but yep. you have to just want to do it all the time. It has to be your, you have to wake up thinking about yeah. it and go to sleep thinking yeah. about it. I mean, it, it really is. It's almost like when you fall in love. Oh my gosh, she's using all my words. Yeah. That's how I feel about startups. Right. Like you can't casually start a couple. <laughs> no, I say that to my students. I'm like, it's like falling in love. You can't just sort of half-ass start a company. No, you like, can't. Yeah, I think I'll start it. I don't know if it's going to work. No, you have to be all in, like psychologically, emotionally. Just, yeah, you just have to, I mean, I was, you know, I was classical music, even though I absolutely love it, was forced down my throat because mm. of my family. Yep. When I start, when I wrote my first song, I think I was like 15. I swear to God, it was like, a, a, I thought I had, I, it was like Jesus, Mary and Joseph, <laughs> Moses. I thought I had really like seen God. Wow. It was, it was, it was, it was like freedom for me. It yeah. was like, oh my God, right. like. I'm out of here in like two years, man, yep. you know? I think we all need some kind of creative outlet, whether it's, you know, yes. I'm not gonna ever be a songwriter, but I, I like to write. I think everyone in this room, if you don't have a creative outlet, you're cheating yourself. Find something, I agree. something creative, doesn't have to be the fine arts. We're all creative beings. Yes, and yeah. we need that outlet for yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Even when you don't think you have time. Right. We'll take the first student's question. Hey, what's up? Hi, what's up? I'm chilling. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so for some background for myself, I'm a YouTube beat maker, producer, oh, yeah, uh, I, licensing beats online. I so remember, yeah, I remember reading your thing. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> yeah. So would you, if I want to do this for a living, would you continue licensing online? Would you try and work with an engineer in the studio, or would you go on Instagram and just find somebody you want to work with, and then just kind of try and grow with whoever that is? What's your name? Hayden. Hayden. Yeah. 
you know, all of the above. I mean, this is the thing. You're, first of all, it's great that you're doing the beats online. I mean, I love that. And, and it's funny because I, I work with so many young people. That's how I try to stay hip. <laughs> Um, but I would say collaboration is one of the most important, like whether it's engineers, fellow producers, songwriters, singers. Um, I, think, I think in this day and age, you have to like, it's kind of like I call it throwing spaghetti at the wall. You really have to try a lot of things because it's, it's just such a weird multimedia type of business now. You never know when that thing you're going to do is just going to go, oop, that just, it just caught fire, you know? Um, now the internet's fantastic, but I would also get out and do. Do you do you perform? Are you a DJ, or do you do anything like that? I am actually DJing California Tacos and Tap Room across the street tonight. Everybody from eight needs to, to go. ten. Be there. Hip hop, pop, okay, throwback. Okay, there you go. Let's get it going. Aiden, I don't need to tell you anything. You got it going on, babe. I mean, you that, that's. You, you just promoted to however many people are here that, yes. You need to DJ, um, beats online, songwriting, you know, learn and, and, and le le also learn the aspects of the business because that's really important. Get some books on the music business if you haven't. You know, so you can learn about, do you, I mean, again, do you know about like fees of licensing and all that? You get your learning. So yeah, so I'm I'm doing it through a website that kind of sets up the contracts for you. Right. But if yeah, if I sell exclusive rights and then the song blows up, I'm gonna be kicking myself. All right, and I just yeah. worked. I worked with a young rapper who d does that too. And I said, you know what? Learn how to make your own beats. You know, like like license the beats, but get a little. I mean, it's come on. It's like you could do it on your iPhone now, right? You, you They're do, pretty simple. You're okay. doing great, though. Yeah. So go from copy to transform. Like move, move to the next phase. Exactly. Exactly. Do your yeah. own beats. Yeah. So let me let me ask you something we talked about off camera uh, briefly. So I just recently I love discovering not necessarily new artists as in terms of contemporary, but new new to me. Mm -hmm. And Emmett Rhodes is one I just discovered. Right. If anybody wants to Google Emmett Rhodes, he was one of these heartbreaking stories where he was extremely talented released a few albums in the early 70s, they floundered, and then he <laughs> spent the next 20 years trying to deal with it. It's like, sugar, um, like Sugarman, yeah. Like, like, like um, Rodriguez from Waiting for uh, mm -hmm. Sugarman. Mm -hmm. um, very similar, very, very talented, just didn't happen for him. Um, and you, I, you must see that all the time, that there's so much talent out there. Um, you also mentioned a trend off camera that's a little disturbing to some extent. Do you wanna talk a little bit about the music business today, how talent is being discovered and sometimes just being talented isn't enough. Yeah, I mean, this is, a, you know, this is a reality. I wish it wasn't. But I've noticed that a lot of the young, uh, when I say kids, people your age, um, come through my studio. A lot of them are being supported by their parents. And that's wonderful. And you know, any of you that are supported by your parents, you know, God bless. But, the problem is, is they get much more of an opportunity than mm. the ones that have to go, you know, bartending and waitering all night. Right, right. So that is, I don't know what the answer to that right. is. Um, I think, I think that's going to change because I think, I think YouTube and the internet has given that a possibility to change. Yep, SoundCloud. And yeah, but even, even the, some of the, you know, I don't want to really mention names right now, but even some of the biggest pop artists right now are very, very very supported by their families. Mm -hmm. And that, that, there's nothing wrong with that. Right. But I would like to see more artists, I'd like to hear more stories about an artist who doesn't come from such a wealthy family right. and who right. just freaking hustled, Right. you know? Well, and you would think they have a different voice, right? It's not better or yeah. worse, but it's a different voice. Exactly. That is, their life experiences were different. That's right. <laughs> yeah. um, Let's talk a little bit about your transition. I mean, I'm, I'm curious because I don't know the answer to this. How did you transition to, uh, to California, but also to TV? And I'm wondering why you didn't, did you, did you do a stint in movies or did you just skip over doing music for movies? Well, you know, back in New York, I had started, I mean, my, my, how I had made way too much money way too young was doing jingles. Uh, and I, and, you know, and that's why I ended up in California <laughs> is I, uh, I made a lot of money. I bought a lot of houses. Uh, I was a wild child for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to kind of start over, mm, in, okay. in, which, in, in, which is an amazing story. 
and I'm humbled and I'm doing better than I ever have now. Mm -hmm. But that part of the tra TV, I was always doing TV music, even though I was a songwriter. Right. Um, when I got to um, LA, I needed to make money. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was doing a lot of songwriting sessions, but... Um, and when you say songwriting sessions, were you, just you collaborating? Get, just getting together and say, hey, you, you know, somebody... But not, would, not for fees. No. With the hope that something... All spec. Got it, got yeah. it, got it, got it. All spec. Um, but I, I got a connection to the ABC Music Library, and they needed some music, and they heard my reel. And this was like 12, 12 years ago. Wow. And, and that's, that led me to Don Soler, yeah, whose beautiful right, family right. is here. Who yep. So Don's family's Jesus. here, and... <laughs> That's okay. It's, we'll edit it out. The reason... I, I guess this is something I do a lot, right? <laughs> the reason Eve's here is because of Dawn. So it's, yeah. a, it's just networking in real life, right? The person I've known for many, many years, a dear friend of mine in Santa Barbara, knows Dawn. Dawn knows Eve. And who knows who Eve is going to turn me on to later. But oh, geez. Just a, you're in trouble. A little bit of pressure. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, on your, so you got out here and you started working with Dawn. And then that, that seems like a really... I mean, obviously, it's a good vehicle for you. Well, it was amazing because you know Dawn, Dawn actually was very responsible for going. Well, you're a song, you're a songwriter, mm. so um, and she would call me and say we need a song for a scene. Mm. So I'm really not, you know. There, See, that's why I asked the question because that's very cinematic. Yes. Right. I mean, my limited understanding of how they score films is you watch the film yes. and you try to add music that fits that yes. moment. This is called song scoring. Okay. And I, I, I kind of gave it that title. But what it is, is they would send me a scene, um, and then they would say, OK, we want you to take like this cover, like a cover of a great song. Yep. I mean, I've done so many, I can't even think of one of them. But say it's a Dylan or whatever. Yep. And they, we, we want you to arrange it in this sort of way. Um, Fogarty, it was a Fogarty song. John, do you know John yeah. Fogarty? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, CCR. Yeah. 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 So, and, and we want you to arrange it in this way, and then at like 40 seconds in, when you, you know, we want you to kind of give us a beautiful 60 second Wow, this is very bed. detailed spec. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, very detailed spec. Is that common, that the spec is like really dialed in and... No, well it is with Dawn because she's so great at what she does. Okay. But not, no, it's not actually that common. Um, it's, sometimes it's just like, give us this kind of song. Mm. Um, but then what would happen is I would send in these songs, and, they, and because I, I have, you know, a lot of skills yep. in working with video they would say i would say can i see the scene so i'd put the scene up with mm -hmm. my song mm -hmm. and then i was really able to score the scene with mm -hmm. my song right right you know yeah well you guys changed the way tv's watched like the way music is incorporated in tv is very different from right. before you guys did it I know. it was background music it was almost music you, you couldn't even hear it yeah. half the time yeah and now it's in the forefront driving the emotion and yeah the dawn scene. dawn was one of the pioneers and, and alex Patsavis, who i also work with is, is a mm. huge pioneer mm. Because she started, she did, she would, they would sign bands because of, of the bands that she would yeah. put on the OC. Yeah, very, yeah. very cool. And she's incorporated, mm -hmm. you know, go watch that episode. It's really entertaining. Right. <laughs> um, you, you talked about, um, I've heard you say before, you've traveled many musical paths. I'm quoting you. In my, I've traveled many musical paths in my career, and I feel a sense of, a, a home, of home in every genre. Mm -hmm. And clearly, you've demonstrated that with your work. But I'm wondering, is there, are there certain styles that you find more challenging, less fun, yeah. more difficult. Which, like, what styles would that? Well, be? I mean, again, I think this is generational. I mean, mm. like, I love house music. I really do. But I'm old, <laughs> and I, you know, I mean, I'm not that old, but I'm pretty old. And I, you know, I, I loved like when I was doing dance music. I was in my twenties. Right. So, like, if somebody asks me to do a like a serious techno mm -hmm. rave kind of thing, right. You know, most of the time I will subcontract that out now. I will uh, learn what everyone's doing. Uh, I, know, I know, I kind of know a lot of the latest and greatest plugins. Yep. But I will call a lot of, like, like I work with two or three people that are like 23 and 24 right but out of Berkeley. That's a great chance for them to come to Well, I know. Them. That's why I'm glad I'm here. I don't know. There might be a few little uh, bugs I can pick. <laughs> Um, but yes, I subcontract it, and That's they cool. and they get to start making a good living and right. getting ASCAP right, right. in their in their yeah, in their twenties. Yeah, they 20s. get some credits, and, mm -hmm. and we know one thing leads to another. So right, exactly. It's awesome. Let's take the next student's question. Hi. Hi. So I know you mentioned it briefly earlier when you had to do the Can Boston. Can you tell me your name? I love names. Danielle. Danielle. Yes. Okay. 
you mentioned earlier how computers are now starting to come to the forefront when you were making the Boston Bruins theme. So how has technology changed the nature of your composing over time? Oh, I mean, I can write an orchestra in five minutes now. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, technology, look, um, there's always the pluses and minuses, but technology, I mean, has, I, I, I can work at like 10 times the speed. So it, it's been amazing on that level. And like, like now, like if I want to, if I, if I'm writing something, like I just did the new Toyota commercial with Shaka Khan, you're going to see it everywhere. It's, if you, you know, it's on, it's on, it's on streaming and, and everywhere. And it's a, we had to do a song called I Put a Spell on You and I had to orchestrate it and I had to write out the, you know, I had to do the violins and the violas. And so now with technology, I, I get to actually hear that. I get to play it in and hear it before I have this, this, you know, 30 musicians come in. So it's, it's been a huge, if you're asking me if it's helped me, is that, is that the question? Beyond. The only thing is I feel in my heart that the only thing that is not right about it is that I think it makes things too easy. So if you haven't gotten a musical education and you haven't studied and you don't, you know, you want to be mm. a great, you want to be a great guitar player or piano player, but you don't know what a G minor seven chord is because you can just hit a note that will be that, you know, that's the part I don't like. So it's a two-way street. Uh, let me ask you a little bit a question or something I raised in your introduction, the Billie Eilish oh, song. Yeah. How did that come about? That sounds like it must have been pretty fun. That was, a, that was like a week ago. Yeah, I know. I know. And then she was late at Coachella. And... It was like, I, got a, I was in Miami with my family and I got a, um, I got a, a, a message on my website that said, hi, my name is Charles somebody from R Rolling Stone. Mm. And we, um, we want to interview you because, you know, Billie Eilish sampled your song. I said, what? <laughs> I was literally, I was, I was shocked. Um, I called him and I said, what are you talking? I'm sorry, I, I don't know what you're talking mm -hmm. about. You know, and he said, well. You've got the wrong Eve Nelson. Yeah. <laughs> and he said, no, no, no. They, all the people from the office mentioned that you had done the song. Oh, good for them. And I know. And, um, and Billie basically said there was um, an episode and I had, I mean, it was really like a simple little beat. It was really stupid. Steve Carell was rapping and mm -hmm, I, mm -hmm. I, had, I, I, it was like, it's so dumb. It's called, we all remember the scene. Do you? <laughs> yeah. It's called Threat Level Midnight. <laughs> they know this? That's crazy. We've got fans out here. That's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. Billie Eilish. So, so she, she said, I got real, I got inspired by the funniness and the Fun. beat. Yeah. And so this is the thing. I don't think she sampled my beat. What she did was she sampled the dialogue mm -hmm. and she used my bass line and slowed it way down. Mm -hmm. So I was very honored. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that I'm, I'm, you know, I don't know that I'm going to actually be part of this song, but it was a great honor to have her be so inspired. Yeah. Yeah. It's cool. And it's cool to see young 17 years old or whatever, young people being inspired by your work. I, I felt so cool. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm so cool. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> you made me laugh, sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about, you mentioned it earlier about having to make money. So you came to LA, you had to make money, right? Yeah. Most of us, unless we're born, not having to make money, have to make money. Right. How did you balance, and especially as your career progressed, you became more successful. I think sometimes students struggle with, am I selling out? Am I just doing this for the money? Yeah. How do you balance that in your career, especially in the beginning and then, and then now? I think it was, I think that was harder for me when I was younger, believe it or not, because I, I really was just so proud. Mm. I was so proud. It was like, I can't artiste. write that terrible pop stuff. Yeah. I was so proud. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie. I, I, I sabotaged some unbelievable opportunities oh. because of my artisticness mm. right. or fear of failure. Right. I'm right. not sure which. A little bit of both. Probably. But like when I was at Jive Records, I was asked to, I was the first person asked to work with this new group called the Backstreet Boys. You're too good for them. Yeah. I, just, I was like, no way. <laughs> so, you know, that was, you know, but that's the thing. I. Uh, it's a, it's a fine line. Yeah. It's a fine line. I you know. Well, we laugh about it because we know what happened. But you know, you were presented with a boy band. Yeah. You're like, come on, another boy band. I mean, no. And I was also, you know, again, I was. I think when you're in your 20s and you're younger, you're just you're trying to find your your power. Right. 
And I'm like, you know, I, and I've got these, these executive people, David Renzer, who, who, who became the president of Universal Publishing. He said, Eve, just, just listen to this stuff on the radio. You could do it in your sleep. Mm. And, I, and it was like, there was, I was just, I was a rebel. Yeah. I was like, no, you know? And so I ended up, I was making a lot of money doing jingles. So I bought myself out of my publishing deal with Zamba and Jive. I gave him, I wrote a check for $40,000 bought myself out of, and mm. I was 23 years old. Mm -hmm. so. and, do you, and did you regret, do you regret that decision? I or? regret being, I regret, I regret not knowing what I know now. Yeah, right, yeah. right. Like, just write, write this, write the dumb I'll Write Come a on. good version of it, right? Yeah. I mean, but it was very formulaic. I mean, I'm not sure this audience it, realizes that, but it, it became very formulaic very quickly. And, it, and look, it's not easy to write a great pop song. I have to, I mean, my friends, my, some of my best friends, Cara Diaguardi is one of my dearest best friends, and and my Lindy Robbins, who's you know these are all people that I'll probably send to you if you want them, <laughs> um, and you know they're huge pop songwriters. It's not easy. Mm. It's not easy. Mm. You have to write like 50 bad songs right, right. to get that. So I, I really do admire it. I think I was afraid of it a little. I was afraid of competing a little bit in that world, mm -hmm. and I had come from such a musical world of classical and jazz and. Right. And and I just I didn't come from a world of being obsessed with pop, mm, mm. so. I can, but I can't see that. I mean, and we joke about that, like turning down the Beatles or something, Decca yeah. Records. But they had good reason in their own time, right? That's they right. just didn't think it would make sense. Guitar bands were going out. Well, I'll take the next student's question. Yeah. Hi. Um, so my question is, how and why did you decide to, to transition from your classical background to do also do other genres of music like R and B and dance? Well, it was very clear to me. I mean, I, I, when I was 16, I, I, I played, I won a Mozart competition and I played with the Miami Youth Orchestra and I blanked out for literally like, I don't know, it's gotta be like 50 seconds. Mm. It was just like, mm. you know, and they were, <laughs> I, it's too, I just, it just, it just terrified me to have to play so perfectly. And I love classical music. I've learned so much. But when I got into a band in high school, um, and I, and I, you know, and I'm, I'm, I was, we were doing like Fleetwood Mac songs, and we were doing like Elton John funeral for a friend. And I just, it was just, it was, it was this incredible high to stand on, to stand on a stage. And, and then I, and I started writing songs. So I was playing my songs in, in high school. So it was, it was, it was like a no brainer, you know? It was a no-brainer. That's where my heart was. I mean, I think I think there's a, you just sort of know, you know. I wasn't cut out for for a classical musical career, no. But you were self-aware again. I think it's a theme. Like it, you, to come to that realization, you have to be self-aware because everyone in this room, including me, your parents want certain things for you because yeah. they love you and they care about you. Um, and at some point in your life, you have to listen to their advice and then do what's right for you. Do you play classical? But yeah, it's, 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 there's a certain, I really think there has to be a certain, um, when you're sitting at the piano in front of uh, you know, millions of people and you're playing Rachmaninoff and you feel completely confident, mm. then you're in the right business. I right. just, yeah, so. So let me go to the, the mutual friends questions, oh. which I've not shared with you <laughs> in any regard and we'll edit out any that you don't want to answer. Oh, please. No, these are all okay. easy. So I just love your quick thoughts on each of these topics. So yeah. these are things people have said about you. They're all very endearing. Um, so one person said, she's such an artist and gets so wrapped up in her work that you often find her with her shirt on backwards <laughs> or inside out. That's Dawn. <laughs> so what she the heck is that all about? That's Dawn. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, Dawn, <laughs> I did go to a major meeting at ABC, and I, and I, and I am. I'm absolutely... I'm attention deficit. I, I mean, I've got all of the, you know, <laughs> like crazy Jewish family from, I mean, it's like, it's the, I mean, the, the fact that I'm sitting here before you is a miracle. It really is. Um, yes, I went to an ABC meeting and, and, and that's, how, that's how you know somebody really loves you <laughs> when, you know, they're an executive of a huge company and, right, and, right. and, she, and she, she's sitting behind her huge desk and I'm like, okay, okay, I'm here, I'm here. And she's like, huh. She's like, go to the bathroom. <laughs> and, that, and I was just like, what? She's go to the bathroom. So, and then, you know, so it, it, that's love, though. Yes, you I know? agree. Yeah. Like, you know you have real friends when they tell you I've stuff I've done that, like that several times, actually. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> it's a pattern. Yeah. 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 Wow. 
Well, I'm really interested in, in this one as well. This is all quotes from people that know you. She has magic healing hands that have cured many. Oh, this is, yeah, well. <laughs> is this from your piano playing? They're... Well, this is, well, you know, you know. I you have... know what posse this came from. Well, it's the, the Soler family, you know, I, I love them so much. They adopted me. When they adopted me into their family. I, when I came here, I, I really didn't know. I didn't know anybody. Mm -hmm. I was, I was, you know, I, 12 years ago, in, in my middle age, I was like reinventing myself, mm -hmm. which is really frightening. Right. Um, you know, to, the house in the Hamptons gone, the New York office gone. You know, the whole nine had to be gone. Yeah. <laughs> um, this family has been so incredibly kind and beautiful to me. So. Yeah, so um, I do. I, I did discover that I had healing hands when my father was dying of cancer. Mm. I didn't know that I had them, but um, he was um, he had lymphoma, and I was called home to say goodbye to him. And I just I didn't even know. I just had my hands on him, and he said in kind of his coma state, "Oh my God, you're healing me! Don't stop! Don't stop!" Wow. And then he lived for six more years. Now, wow. trust me, I don't think. I mean, I don't know. That's it's a little far fetched. But I have what's called hot hands. So if you have, if you have something that's wrong and I put my hands on that place, um, I start breaking out in a sweat. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I know. I, it's, it's weird. Somebody <laughs> needs, some of you smart young people need to study this so that we, because remember they used to, you know, when, when a lot of the Eastern things in China in the 70s came over, people were like, acupuncture is bold. Oh no! It, this is and weird. It's like, no, it actually works. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not all frou frou. Like I break out in a sweat. It's like a major. If something, yeah. if you have an it, like arthritis, or if, you know, I've worked on Kelly. Christy, have I worked on you? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to work. Yeah, but yeah, but it's it's like you know, neck, shoulder. Wow. So yeah. And people do need to study that because there's obviously something there. Right? Yeah, I, I, I would like I to don't know find out more about it. Right. What I'm, is the physiological? Yeah, it's energy. Yep. Well, that is awesome. Maybe we'll be spending more time together after this. <laughs> <laughs> so here's another one. Food is synonymous with Eve. A meal <laughs> is always part of a, of a session, excuse me, at the um, Orange Coach. Orange, the, orange Couch. I messed that wrong, yeah. sorry. At the Orange Couch. Yeah, well, studio. that comes from a, being in a big Jewish Is that the name of your studio? Sorry. Oh, orange Couch. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, you guys can go on Instagram. I'm the Orange Couch Sessions. Um, that comes from a family where, you know, if you're not eating, you're not loved. No, <laughs> no I, come, I come from a very big Jewish family where it was just cent centered, around, centered around that. Right, right. But the, the, the part of it that I loved was that my mother was a piano teacher and there was always like a, a, like a big, big chicken boiling in the kitchen. Right. You yep. know? So, you, yep. you, you know, it was, it, was, it was bizarre but wonderful. Yeah. So I kind of... I'm always cooking something in my kitchen, and even though I have like these celebrities and people walking in, they're like, God, "What is that?" You know, and they're immediately feeling at home. Yeah, right. You know. No, I don't. I don't. So, I think that's wonderful. Yeah. And I heard your clam linguine is famous. <laughs> this is the last one. Your clam linguine is famous because not only do you clam with your feet, um, but lovingly wash each, but lovingly wash each clam, so that you can taste the love and the sea together. Oh God. I want um, friends like this. Yeah, no. I, if I didn't do music, I would. I would be. I would want to be like either a chef or a, a food critic. It's just yeah. But it's another creative outlet. I mean, cooking it is, at that it is level is very so, creative. It is so creative. Yeah. 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 No. No. I. I when I lived in the Hamptons, because I'm. I had a. I, I. I had when I had loads of money back in the day, and I. I bought some houses and I, uh, I lived in the Hamptons and I, and I call it the decade of distraction because I don't remember a lot of it. Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry guys, I'm gonna be honest, okay? Like, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you it's all been perfect because that's bull. Right, right. Um, anyway, I learned to clam. I got friends with the clammers oh. and I learned to clam and, and, I, and, and I, I make the best linguine and clams you've ever had in your life. Wow. Yes, that is true. And you do get them with your toes. Yes, you, you clam with your feet because you clam in the mud. So you, you feel them and then you, and then you just reach down and pick them up. Wow. Uh, does any, anybody East Coast here, Long Island, Boston, anything? No? We got a few. Wow. I, I, it's like the shore, right? It's the shore, not the beach. No, they're like, they're like why would we go there? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that cold, miserable place. We've got a beach place. right over here. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I, I don't know that we'll go through each of these, but I'm curious, and I'll get to the next student's question after this. Um, but I'm just curious, we talked a little bit more about good music or good yeah. songs. You have done so many different, you're just 
in so many aspects of music. I'd love to hear the projects you were most satisfied with. So that doesn't mean you had any external validation. You just personally were satisfied. As a songwriter, composer, producer, arranger, conductor, if you want to break it that finely. Yeah. But what projects were you, just you walked away saying, I don't even care if this is successful, I, I like well, it. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I can, the, the first one that comes to my head is, in 2005, I got to conduct the London Symphony. Ah. And I did a, a, a jazz standards Abbey record. Abbey Road, right? What's that? Abbey, that Road? Abbey Road, yeah. yeah. With Shaka Khan. And, oh, man. I, yeah, I, I don't remember. I mean, that I, I was I was lifted. It was like I was lifted off the ground. Because mm. we did, like, 12 songs in five hours. Wow. But th these are the most incredible musicians. I had 80 musicians. Wow. And it was, you know, I, and I'm not really a conductor, but I, I learned enough conducting chops mm -hmm. to conduct that. And they invited me back to Royal Albert Hall, and oh they gave gosh. me the standing ovation. And I, yeah, I, I could, it's almost like I couldn't even take it. And this is before I moved to L.A., and it was so intense for me that I remember going home on the plane and getting violently ill the entire oh, wow. way. It was so, it was like so much love and energy. And the way they played my charts, it was like, uh, yeah, so I, I could have I, I could have died and gone to heaven, and and that would have been that. So would've when been are fine. you going to do more of that? That obviously fed you. When are you going to do more? Well, of that? it's funny that you say that. You know, I went back to New York after that, and I and I I went and I did like a McDonald's commercial and made oodles of money, and I was miserable. Mm. You know, and um, that kind of was that was there was like a two year depression that happened right after that. Wow. And that's what got me to L. A. Because you knew in your heart what you wanted to do, and yeah. you knew what you had to do, and they weren't the same. Oh, well, I had run, I had sort of run away. You know, we, you, you guys are going to go through so much stuff. I mean, I, I went through this period where I just wanted to be normal. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to hang out with like the cleavers and <laughs> and go to the soccer games and everything. Right, you right, know, right. Um, but that just wasn't who I was. Right. So that was, you know, the, my life in the Hamptons was sort of. It's kind of like I left New York in the dust, even mm. though I paid for mm. an office and a right. studio and everything. I was maybe there once every two weeks. Right. So, um, yeah. Uh, wow. God, he's God. You're making me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna need like a therapist. I know this is like this. this is your life or something. <laughs> <laughs> Which they don't know what that is. Exactly. <laughs> we'll take the next student's question. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, would you say that as your career continues, you stay true to the R&B and gospel roots you originated from, or does every piece you do become part of your music persona? And more specifically, how do you deal with the trends of music? Do you stick to what you know, or do you incorporate new trends that may be risky and challenge your strong I love reputation? that question. I love that question. Um, and I remember reading it. Um, R&B and gospel for me is like the most natural thing. For me, it's like, I mean, I don't know if, you know, any of you play sports, but it's like the minute you're on the field or you're hitting the tennis ball, it just, boom. These, these other forms of music that I've learned to love and, and do, a lot of it for me is like, you know when a director is like casting somebody for a role? I become so immersed. Like I had to, you know, if I have to do like a Brazilian track, I just flood my ears with with just one Brazilian song after the next. And I, and I, 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 let, I like become the music when I, have to, when I have to write it. Does that make sense? It's like becoming the role that you have to play. I, 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 do, I, do, tr I do try to do new, these days I'm more, I'm more uh, risky than I've ever been, which is funny because I would never have been that risky when I was your age, you know? These days I'm like, you know what, let me mix let me mix a weird R&B chord here with like, like a weird Billie Eilish distorted drum. You know, like I, I'm becoming very risky now because I feel like I have nothing to lose. So yes, um, I, I, I do believe that uh, taking all of the genres that you learn and bringing them into kind of a, you know, like it's, it's a recipe. It's like, you know, it's like you've got this like little recipe and it's like, you know what, this, I'm making this tonight and I know that if I add this into that, it's gonna make it even that much more special. Does that make sense? Cool. Uh, so I'd love to hear when you're, because music is your work. For mm -hmm. most people, music is their relaxation. So when, you're, when you really just wanna listen to music, not work on music. I don't what, wanna listen to music. <laughs> Oh, okay. That makes it easy. So you, I was going to ask you, what are you drawn to? Like what? New age music. Okay, so just background. I'm not kidding. I, I'm, I, I'm sitting in front of speakers all day long. Right. Um, 
I mean, unless I'm at a party dancing or something, I, I, I either love silence that makes sense. or like, drones. That's like asking yeah. a, sh a baker, what kind of cake do you eat when you're not exactly. making cakes? It's like, well, I don't really eat cake. No, so, yeah. exactly. Okay, so yeah. I, I was also going to ask you what streaming services do you use, but you're not using streaming services to listen to your music. Well, I'm very upset with Spotify right now. Okay. Um, uh, so I'm not, I've, I've gotten rid of Spotify. Um, they're, 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 I don't know if you know what's happening, but because they are, of the artists, they they are yeah they're very they, they're 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 doing they're not supportive of songwriters. Mm, okay. Um, iTunes, I use iTunes. Oh, okay. I, I, I use Apple iTunes. Um, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, I just was curious. How do you? Or I was. I'm not sure if you were kicking it with old school vinyl or. You know, how I do you, love old school vinyl. Yeah. Yeah, and I have old school vinyl, but I'm just you know, have you guys got anybody gotten into vinyl? I hope. Ah, yeah. oh, love that. Look at that. That's great. Sounds so much better, doesn't it? Like, no comparison. Isn't that horrible that these kids, like, didn't get to grow up on vinyl? I know, but, but it's cool for them to go back at the I retro know. thing. Because it feels, I mean, we, we knew what it used to sound like. I think exactly. it would be cool to listen to it with fresh ears. Oh, it, so, is a, it is a very different, incredible. warm yeah. sound. Yeah. So I have about 200 questions that I'm not going to get to, okay. but I'm going to end with this one. And Jeffrey, I'm sorry I didn't get to your question, buddy. Aww. <laughs> you can well, ask me after... When we're, when I'm, I'm like, yeah. 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 You guys can chat. Um, so I'm just curious, uh, I, we touched upon it a little bit with the Abbey Road experience mm -hmm. and then you, the, how bummed out you were after that. What musical challenges remain for you? Like in the next five, 10 years, what, what are you going to be disappointed if you don't get done? Um, man, you know, I've got, it's funny. I've got, I've gone back. I love everything that I'm doing in television music and I love everything that I'm doing in orchestration and all that. But I still have a passion to just write the greatest song I've ever mm. written. I don't think I've written it yet. You know? And how are you gonna get there? So are I, you I, are you gonna be able to balance all of this work you're doing? Well, yeah, I mean I, I do find time with certain songwriters. I will write with Kara, write with you know, I've got some great songwriter friends that I will, I will work with, or artists mm -hmm. um, who have deals. I love sometimes to work with an artist who has a new deal. Yeah. But um, I, I do squeeze it in there, but I, I might have to give it some more focus because I still have that passion. Right. To write, the, you know, again, I don't know, again, like, like a song like I Can't Make You Love Me by Bonnie Raitt or mm, something mm, that's just so right, classic. Right, right. I, I, I want to I wanna write a classic. So a song that when you first hear it, you think it's a cover. Yeah, like not, a so trendy, not a trendy, not a trendy, because there's they, they're going to write the trendy songs. Right, I, I don't right. need to do that. No, I, I think I, 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 I yeah. feel you with this. Like when McCartney wrote yesterday, he kept running around going, I know this isn't new. It can't be new. It's like it's too right. classic. Exactly. And people were like, no, dude, I think it's a new. Yeah, I still want to do that. I still feel I have, feel I have I haven't, you know. So if, you know, if I get the chance, great. If not, it's been. It's I think been you've got to make the chance. So you're right. I think you've got to maybe go on a writing sabbatical. You're right. I or do. partner with somebody and say, Listen, every Thursday. Hell yes. Yeah, do it. They're always asking, too. They're always saying, every Thursday, please. You know, I yeah, have to make yeah, the time. Yeah, make yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. We want you to make the time. Thank we, you. We're selfish. We want to hear that song. Okay, good. All right, now I have a goal. Thank you. Thank you.